I'd like to welcome everyone to Mindful Mobility Tech Talks. And this series is presented by Green Transportation Summit at Expo, West Coast Collaborative, Mobilize California Driving Change. The uh, series, first part of the series is addressing workforce fundamental training, electric vehicle and ADAS systems, advanced driver assisted systems. Next screen. Our webinar is sponsors are Clean Cities of Columbia Winlamet, Clean Cities of Treasure Valley, Idaho, and Clean Cities of Long Beach. Next slide. Before we uh, go too far, we're gonna go ahead and identify our second seminar, identifying the foundational training for electric vehicle technicians. Dr. Mark Quarto will be the speaker for that, August the 27th, that's a Thursday, also at 1 p.m. Pacific. Here's the link to register. I encourage everyone to register ahead of time. It's gonna be very popular. Dr. Quarto is very uh, well known in the electric vehicle field. Next slide. A quote from John Hayward, professor of mechanical engineering at MIT, he says, cars are everywhere. They're one of the biggest, most complicated products that we use every day. Next slide. As we move along through this series, a little housekeeping, I'd like for you to use the chat box for talking with other attendees. You will not be able to ask a question in, a, uh, in the presentation other than in the question and answer section. So go ahead and ask those questions using the questions box and feel free to lodge your question during the presentation. We'll answer those first come first serve. Uh, I'll be helping with that and each of our speakers will be answering their questions as well. There will be a webinar recording and you can go ahead and request that and then if you have questions, answers, things that you want to get more information about, say so in the question and answer box. Leave us your contact. We have your contact, but make sure we have your name. An additional email would be helpful as well. So go ahead and complete the feedback form at the very end. And this helps us to know if this is beneficial to you or your company. Next slide. Everybody's awake. Hi, I'm Ken Mays, and I'm uh, the Director of Automotive Technology at Central Oregon Community College in sunny Bend, Oregon. Everybody wishes they were in Bend, Oregon. One of the projects I've been working on for the last seven years is uh, with a development of advanced, ve advanced vehicle technician standards who are working with uh, vehicle electrification systems, which includes fuel cell. So this is a, um, a huge project and we have two consultants, 10 advisory. It's a uh, pretty impressive thing and we're just about finished, almost accomplished in this. Next slide. The, 
housing of these standards is at this site. It's called the Center for Advanced Automotive Technology, a National Science Foundation Center. The grant that we're working with is the NEVTEC grant, which stands for Northwest Engineering and Vehicle Technology Exchange. Next slide. The first set of standard categories, and there's a lot of work underneath each one of these headings. Uh, these directly are linking you to vehicle electrification system, non-fuel cell. Next slide. These are categories for fuel cell, and these also involve a, a huge amount of work. But we have been after this for a little bit of a time, and we expect to see not only um, these charts, these standards established, but we'll start seeing um, certifications. We have uh, linked with SAE Probitas to come out and work with us to develop these certifications. Uh, we'll see how that moves in the next three years. But before we go much further, we're also in the initial conversation about the ADOS systems. What do technicians need to have to be able to work with these systems? And so we picture standards being developed with that as well. Uh, because these are so new, many of these are so new that um, we don't know what's gonna ultimately happen in the next five years. So we know, kind of have an inkling, but what does the technician need to know? And that's why we're doing this today. Uh, vehicle electrification and ADOS systems, as you put your questions together today, uh, we'll try to do the best we can to answer those today, a point in time, and then we will um, come back on the following sequence of, of these uh, on this series. Next slide. So we're gonna do a polling question first here, and I'd like for you all to respond to this. I'll read the polling questions and with the two questions. So let's go to the next slide on the polling. So the first one, and you can go ahead and answer these right now. How many of the attendees, how many of you are working with ADOS systems now? Yes, no, or what's ADOS? The second question is for your company, where do you plan to have your technicians trained on ADOS systems? Local community college or technical college, manufacturer specific courses, intensive on-site training, example, one week training at specific locations, online training. I do not know where to start. And if you don't know where to start, make sure your name is included somewhere at the end on the survey. We'd like to encourage you towards some of these things. I'll give you 15 more seconds. Next slide. On the on the end of this, it looks like um, how many attendees are working with ADOS systems? 26% yes, 61% no. What's ADOS? 13%. Where do you plan on going for training? 34% local technical college. Manufacturer courses, 13%. Intensive on-site training, example, one week's training at certain locations, 11% online training, and you don't know where to start, 13%. Thank you for doing that. It is my pleasure to include and invite Scott Brown to be our first speaker. And Scott is well known in our industry. Scott is a ASC master certified automotive technician with over three and a half decades of professional service industry experience. He and his wife own Connie and Dick's Auto Service Center located in Claremont, California, which is celebrating their 60th anniversary in 2020. With a strong focus on engine performance and electronics, Scott began collaborating with other industry professionals online beginning in the early 90s. Since 1995, he 
it has been an instrumental resource in the development of the largest online community of automotive service professionals, the N International Automotive Technicians Network, IATN, where he once served as company president. Additionally, he serves on the NASTF, National Automotive Service Task Force, Board of Directors, and is a member of the following associations, ASCCA, CAT, ETI, ICAR, and SAE. Scott is the founder of Diagnostic Network. We've all heard of that. It's been out since 2018, and you can see the link for that right now. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Scott Brown. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, one, I'm, I'm really privileged to, uh, to be part of this uh, presentation. And uh, I'm, I'm here to really share my perspective from the technician, the working technician and independent sector. So uh, let's get started. So next slide, please. So it, it's, uh, there's no secret, the automotive technicians, they, we are operating in a, an extremely demanding environment. Uh, the vehicle complexity or the vehicle technology stack continues to explode. And uh, the, the, you know, the problems that start to surface on vehicles as they get five, 10, 12, 13 years old, um, there are things that pop up that aren't covered in service information. And technicians need to have a really strong foundation um, across a number of fields. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So next slide, please. So the things that I want to talk about that <clears throat> I think are really beneficial here are that we need, we need to have a great understanding of vehicle technology, but we need to also uh, learn how to deal with consumers. Consumers are the ones that are basically driving these vehicles. They're the ones that are uh, paying for this service. We need to be able to communicate properly because a lot of this, we have to educate consumers um, as to what is really happening with their vehicle, what it takes to actually do the job properly. And then that boils down to the, to the compensation part. And we're going to talk a, a little bit about that because this is something that, that I see is, is the elephant in the room and not many people are talking about this. So next slide, please. So talking about the vehicle technology, um, that, that first bullet point there, that's 150 million lines of code. And that was a big selling point um, at SEMA in 2016. 2016, Ford Motor Company announced their F-150 had 150 million lines of code on it. So, you know, that's an F-150. What are the other vehicles? Um, what do they have running on them? What's a Mercedes have? What's a BMW have? Uh, these vehicles are all around us and, and there are so many variables that can show up down the road that these technicians need to have an extreme level of understanding of all of the different variables and, and things that, that, uh, that, that can happen. So that presents a lot of challenges for technicians. So technicians that are attending traditional uh, classes, um, you know, to, to stay updated, they need to be, be able to attend other training sessions and things that, that don't normally happen. Um, in the industry today, it, primarily in the aftermarket, you see technicians that end up going to classes in the evening um, to, get, to get up to date, right? And you look at other industries and technicians are basic, or employees or technicians in, in uh, say a communications industry or, or other fields, they are going to school during the day, during the same time that they would normally be working. So, you know, they're not out there burning both ends of the candle. And, uh, and that's some of the things that our industry needs to really take a look at. And so that our technicians can actually stay updated and not get burnt out. Uh, next slide, please. So consumers today, you know, because of the internet, um, there's a, a ton of knowledge that they can gain. Um, of course, not all of the knowledge can be true. Um, you know, consumers can walk into a shop and, and now have expectations that are, are out in left field due to the information that they've gathered. Um, they may have seen some YouTube video that explains, oh, this problem on this car always is this. And, um, and, and, and we have that happen in our shop all the time. Customers come in and say, well, I read it on YouTube or I saw it on YouTube. All it takes is you hook it up to this machine and, 
and the code tells you that this is the problem and uh, that's not how it goes. I mean, it is just very, very difficult. So, you know, we need to be able to triage that, right? You need to be able to deal with that and inform your consumers so that uh, they get on board with the reality, right? So next slide, please. One of the big things that I see um, lacking in our industry is documentation. Um, we get a lot of vehicles that come in here and they, they may have been bouncing around from shop to shop uh, trying to get solved. And we asked to look at, you know, well, what's been done to the car? We, we kind of need to understand, you know, what, what's been done to it. And boy, I've read documents that have come from the dealerships and, and other service centers, and it's hard to tell what exactly took place in this vehicle. Um, what was, you know, what, where the car was when it originally failed. Um, but technicians, if they can learn how to document and articulate what it is that they're doing with the vehicle and do, you know, take, take rich content notes, right? Everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket now. Take an image, take a video, um, narrate. Uh, if they can do all of that and then add that information in your communication cycle within your, your shop, um, that's just going to add much more value to what, what it is that you're delivering to the consumer. So those of you that are educators out there, I highly uh, recommend that you work on helping these technicians or these students understand how to document and, and, uh, and explain and tell the story. So next slide, please. So, and then that brings us to compensation and, and uh, Kurt's gonna be talking next. And, and Kurt and I have been working on this presentation for a while and he's gonna go into depth on a, on a number of, of topics here. But the last thing here I wanna talk about is compensation. You know, our industry, um, primarily in the, in the aftermarket, uh, you know, they're on this flat rate program where the technician only gets paid, you know, he gets paid for what, what he's doing to the car sometimes, right? Uh, the job may call for two hours and, and uh, they may not pay for any analysis time, which is really the, the backwards part, right? Now, a lot of times the analysis time is really what it takes to actually get the direction on what to do to the vehicle. And a lot of technicians are discouraged from even getting to the point where they want to become a diagnostician because they've traditionally not been compensated for that. Um, when we get into the ADAS stuff that, that uh, Ken was talking about, um, ADAS uh, calibrations and, and vehicle setup and, and uh, you know, establishing all of these uh, parameters, that's not good for a, a flat rate uh, environment. Uh, things can easily go sideways if, if somebody does missteps and, and doesn't measure properly or what have you. So uh, a lot of the legacy things that have been happening in, in past need to change. And otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of technicians to other industries. I know that a lot of tech schools out there right now, they are like the grapevine for a lot of other industries because these, these students are getting a lot of training and other industries are coming in and they're, say, they're saying, hey, come to work for us. We'll provide you with benefits. You don't have to buy your own tools. You'll be uh, you know, working eight to five, Monday through Friday. Um, you'll be going to training during the day. Um, those are things that uh, just don't really exist in our marketplace today, and uh, it's, it's anti-attractive. Um, so we've got to make a lot of changes um, to really face the fact that, hey, we're, we're working on a very highly complex uh, vehicle, and we need a workforce that's highly capable to address problems when they surface. So next slide, please. And Q&A. We have any questions? I was just uh, this is Scott. This is Ken, and I'm just looking at the um, question bank, and nothing's coming in. I asked Manny to see if it's blocked by any chance, but I do have a question or two myself. Um, you have been doing studies yourself for a bit of time on ADOS systems and vehicle electrification. You and your shop, and you're part of associations that look at these things, and you glean. You kind of become a futurist in some regard. But where I think you're teaching classes on ADOS, is that correct right now? Yes, yes, I, I am, and we have a classroom here in, in our in our workshop. Uh, we do classes on Saturdays for uh, for shops that uh, are are getting into this uh, 
So they're uh, full day classes, you do them once a month or those type of things? We're, right now, we were doing them once a month up until COVID hit. Um, we just did one last month uh, as a catch up. Um, we had quite a few people that wanted to attend and uh, we, we, we got that one done. But, uh, but yeah, the, and these are great because, uh, you know, we, we spend the morning talk, going through some uh, formal presentations and then we spend the rest of the day actually doing hands-on. You know, we rent some new cars and uh, we go through and uh, do calibration and, and uh, make everybody actually do the work, um, right. not just show them. You're using an alignment system as part of that training, is that correct? Yes, yeah, we're, we're doing that in partnership with a, with a supplier that, that we work with, a company called AES Wave. Okay. And, um, and it's their customers that are, we're basically educating. Um, as they, they acquire the equipment, we're getting them up to speed with, uh, with, so they can hit the ground running, so to speak. In your experience so far, you see uh, technicians who have a lot of strength, and then you see technicians that need more strength and need more background. What would you say is the first thing you would address for technicians who uh, need a little more uh, build up in their foundational skills? What, what area would you specify? Well, I think uh, this holds true, I think for the, the bigger part of the industry as well. And that's uh, the information resources, uh, uh, where to look for the, the data. Uh, a lot of the service uh, procedures are, are highly ambiguous um, on when you're supposed to do a particular uh, procedure on a vehicle. Um, some manufacturers say that you need to do it after wheel alignment but they don't usually call it out in the wheel alignment procedure. You need to go into like a, a particular system. So being able to search out that information, uh, being able to verify that uh, you know, modules are up to date and, and uh, the, the firmware levels are correct, um, make sure there are no open recalls. So there's, I think the, the foundation of a shop workflow is gonna change. You're, you're gonna have a technical information specialist that's basically gonna to have to acquire a lot of this data to make sure that whatever that vehicle is coming in for, that it leaves the facility, regardless of what work was done on it, in, in the right state, uh, working state. Um, and there's a big, you know, there's a big deficiency out there right now within the collision industry. Um, you know, this is why the OEMs have all these position statements in place about these pre post scans they want to make sure that when that car goes in to, after re, getting a repair procedure, that it's put back out on the road in the same condition it was when it left the assembly line. And, um, and this is, you know, I, I see that this is a huge thing. So technicians really need to start paying attention to the vehicles that are working, flowing through their, their work bays today, because a lot of that technology is already there. And they may be touching things that, uh, they may be affecting and they don't, they don't know they're supposed to be doing certain things to make sure that they're uh, put back in order uh, before it gets released back to the consumer. You've had some uh, uh, really sharp technicians, people who have studied this and prepared for a class like yours. Uh, what are the uh, qualities that you see in those technicians? So a lot of these guys are, are very resourceful in reading a scan tool. Um, mining through, you know, tons and tons of data. Uh, sometimes the data parameters might be a little bit different in, in different manufacturers. They may call, call it out a little bit differently. Um, so that's, that's a big strength. Uh, being able to, to analytically look at, at the system, um, especially when they have a problem. Uh, you know, the, the calibrations that we've been doing here in the shop are primarily their sublet. You know, they've, the car has been to a collision center um, and then it comes to us to, to get reset. Um, and a lot of times it's not a simple reset. It's actually getting it functioning again. There may have been a connector or a wiring problem. So learning how to, uh, or making sure that you can master, um, you know, your, your electronics or your electrical diagnostics, network communications, um, and then being able to set up and establish the calibration and then being able to take the car out and validate that it's actually operating the way that it's supposed to be operating. Um, I think that's another deficiency. A lot of the, a lot of technicians, you know, are probably not driving cars with these high features and shops should probably start renting some of these cars and getting highly familiar with them because 
you know, consumers are, are probably going to come in and they're going to be a little unclear on how systems work and, and you know, we're the experts. We, we need to be able to present to them or actually help guide them so that they know how to operate their, uh, their advanced uh, vehicles. Very good. Thank you very much, Scott. I've got some questions coming in and you can open them up yourself. I've got um, a question from Boise. Okay. And I, are you able to see that? Yep, I got the question. So let's see. Um, I see John Gustafson. Uh, hi, John. I, I know John very well. Thank you. Uh, he's, he just had a comment. Uh, let's see, Carl from Bo Boise. Um, remember about 10 years ago when CTI had dedicated business class in the annual, the annual rotation. Do you know of any class sources that a small shop business owner could visit? Um, I'm lucky and came to auto repair with an economics degree. It's proven invaluable. Um, well, do I know of any small, of, of any class sources that put on shop business owner that is, so I, I guess I'm reading this in real time here. Let's, uh, I'll, are you I'll part I'll of make, the, I'll yeah, make a suggestion, you, Scott. So go ahead. So, so, uh, every community college has small business development portion and, 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 uh, that's where I would certainly go they would customize your education based on your needs. And they have some great classes that are sometimes two years long. So you might want to investigate that at CTI there in Idaho. That's, um, they, they, I'm sure have that small business development. Hope that helps a little bit. And uh, when he's saying CTI, what is he referring to there? That's the college there okay, in, uh, outside of Boise. Uh -huh. You know, and the, I would break in real quick and say, um, here in the Northern California area, ASCCA does a lot of uh, business to business type of seminars and things like that. Um, so that might be another avenue for kind of that one night brush up for different topics and such. I've seen that quite often. Yeah, and the, the other outlet there, there, there are a lot of suppliers in our, in our market. Um, one of them being, I know you said CTI, but C, there's a CTI in the aftermarket, CarQuest Technical Institute. And uh, one of their partners is the uh, World Pack, uh, World Pack Technical Institute, and they both offer some excellent uh, training, um, you know, in-service training, um, both the management side and then the technical side. So that's something that you may want to look at as well. Scott Gordon, Scott, um, another Scott, Gordon Scott. I hope this is the Gordon Scott I know. Are there any types of programs you would suggest for a high school student to concentrate on outside the traditional automotive realm? Um, I, I'm working with a local uh, high school here, the, the high school that I actually went to, um, and the automotive instructor there, and he's actually been to our classes over here for the ADAS. Um, we, we had big plans to, to do some uh, field trips and stuff, but I think that if we start turning these students on to some of these high-tech things that are going on in the vehicle, um, I think that that will get their mind and their juices flowing and thinking about um, other things that they might want to get into. Uh, this is this is an exciting um, industry, and there are probably things that are going to come to the uh, boil to the surface here that don't exist today. And uh, you know, a student could actually end up going to work for an OEM doing uh, test and development, or or a service development, right? On on how to uh, do calibrations uh, better. Uh, uh, some of these processes that we see actually being um, forecasted by the OEM are just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, some of these are just crazy. And some of the aftermarket companies are coming up with better ways to actually carry out that process and, uh, with, with the same positive effect. So um, I would start turning them on to some of, the, some of these high-tech features that are going on in these vehicles. Um, that makes it really exciting. The, uh, the courses I think that students in the high school arena would be is in uh, areas of programming. Uh, consider programming, they're teaching programming in the first elementary schools now. Continue that line. Um, being able to work with the high school physics um, program because they teach basic electricity in the physics. They don't often teach it if there's not an automotive program, if there's an automotive program, you try to plug into that. Hopefully they're articulated with a community college. And I think uh, build up your math skills, because you're certainly, and computer skills along the way. 
That's yeah, what one, I would definitely suggest is, you know, look into the business communications classes, uh, basic computer applications. And, you know, here in California, most of the school districts have um, uh, a concurrent enrollment agreement with the community college. So while that student's still in high school, uh, they can be taking college classes for college credit at no cost. Um, so that way they can get that other side because like Scott had mentioned, the ability to use resources to find information, uh, computer skills is, is still a bit of a challenge and we're in an industry right now where we're still using a lot of PC based things and, and also the communication side, being able to speak well, write well, not just use text type languages. Yeah, one more thing there, uh, Ken, you, you just uh, uh, triggered um, the, the programming or learning how to, to write a little bit of code. Not that you're going to be a coder. Um, I, I remember, you know, it was probably about 25 years ago or so, um, Steve Jobs basically said, everybody should learn how to program or everybody should take like a year and learn how to do coding. And because, not because they want to become, become a coder, but it teaches you how to think because you may be writing some code and then the code doesn't work. Well, now you have to troubleshoot it. The same thing applies today on vehicles. You've got vehicles that go into failure modes and the service manual doesn't give you the, the right direction. Um, and you have to start thinking, hey, why is this doing, why is this going into this failure mode? So that that is something. And the next speaker of the, the, uh, the next speaker for the next event, that's the Dr. Mark Porto. He teaches a course on that, and I actually attended um, his one-week boot camp course earlier this year. And you know, I've taken other programming courses before, just because I wanted to learn more. But it has helped me in my technical aptitude in the shop today, because I can look at things a little bit differently um, and and try to figure these things out. So a lot that of was a, that was an online course too, wasn't it, Scott? No, no, that was an in-person. Uh, okay. That was a that was a great course because we were building circuits, we were writing code, um, you know, some basic language, and uh, it was uh, it was pretty pretty intense. Well, let's ask for the updates next week on uh, Doctor Porto. Next question yep. here is from Steve Ford. Can you see that? Okay, Scott. Yep, and I know Steve. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Uh, based on the comments about the realities of actual diagnostics versus the perception of the plug and scan tool. Okay. How do you envision the industry being able to increase the hourly rate without consumers being vastly more educated? Yeah. Um, and then do you see the industry capable of doing a better job of connecting with media and consumer motorists? So um, Steve is, uh, Steve and I go way back and he's a, uh, he's got a very broad perspective and uh, a number of skill sets. So um, I, I know he's trying to set me up for something, right? <laughs> uh, he wants me to deliver some, some cool stuff. Um, you know, really the consumers today, even if you look at the ADAS stuff, um, they're being advertised that uh, they push a button. There's a commercial out there where the customer just lets go of the steering wheel. They show that scene for a second and it's, it's to that's not what is happening. Um, I think consumers need to take more stock in their vehicle. I mean, it's one of the it's a pretty big investment and they need to understand that uh, it takes a skilled technician uh, to, to put that vehicle back in order or keep it, keep it going. Um, so we definitely have to change that mindset uh, and, and have the consumer make an investment. I mean, it starts out of the gate. The consumer buys a car and they tell them, Hey, you don't need to come back for 10,000 miles because the oil is good for 10,000 miles. It's, it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, and I, I think that, I mean, I, I think the industry, I think we all need to be the brand ambassadors, right? And this, this goes back to the communication. If we're all able to individually communicate at a higher level and illustrate what's really happening with these vehicles, and I think we will do, do very well with bringing that, uh, that awareness at, to a higher level for the consumers so that they totally understand that wow, these guys are uh, these guys are really important. We're an essential business. Hey, we we've been working every day now since uh, COVID came, and um, and and I'm proud to to be here. Um, but uh, yeah, we 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 all need to work together to uh, to raise that bar. 
Um, next question is from Carl. Uh, what specific auto repair CC is a good idea? Thanks. Okay. Oh, CTI. He was referring to Car Quest Technical Institute. So, so yeah, CTI and WTI. I, I would go to to the WTI website. They're now merging a lot of that stuff together, and uh, they've done a very good job of actually move trans. Um, spinning up uh, online training. So there's a lot of that that's available as well. So um, Larry says, clarify all acronyms, please. Yeah, PLS, he said PLS. So PLS means please. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have a lot of uh, acronyms in our, in our uh, industry and uh, yeah, I, I, I get it. Um, and uh, let's see, Gordon Scott, yeah, Ken, that's the Gordon you know. Uh, Nelson Kelly says, um, what are the OEMs doing with their dealership training programs, including the ones at community college to make sure their cars are properly repaired? So um, I'll, I'll give you my answer here on the dealership training programs. Um, some of them are actually pretty heavily involved on the collision side. Uh, I serve on the board of the uh, Automotive Management Institute, AMI, and uh, they've got a, um, They've got an arrangement with one OEM today, that's FCA, and a lot of their training is now required for a body shop to be certified as an FCA uh, collision center. And they roll in all of their factory uh, service uh, information training, scan tool training. Uh, they now have a new ADAS training, so that's, that's all available through the, the AMI um, online. Um, I think, and a lot of OEMs have relationships with community colleges. I know that they, they've got a number of them at Kurt's uh, school. Uh, so I'll, I'll let uh, Kurt take, take that from here. Okay, how about, how about I introduce Kurt right now and uh, have uh, Kurt go ahead and uh, start his part of the program. I'd like to introduce Kurt Shadbolt and I only met Kurt uh, less than three months ago um, I am continually impressed by the depth he has, his background. Uh, Kurt has been in automotive industry, been in the industry for over 35 years as a technician and educator. His experience as a technician was focused on European cars at both the dealer and independent level, specializing in electrical, drivability, and diagnostics. As an educator, Kurt has taught at technical schools, high school regional occupational programs, California Community College, and BMW manufacturer training levels. Professionally, he is an ASE master technician with L1, California Bureau of Automotive Repair certified instructor and license inspector and repair technician as has a Bachelor of Science from Florida, Florida Metropolitan University in higher education management and associates in automotive technician at, from Sequoia Institute and manufacturer training from multiple OEMs. Kurt has extensive experience in curriculum development and implementation having completed curriculum work for multiple manufacturers, state of California, regional grants projects, and various levels of educational programs. Currently, Kurt is one of the automotive faculty at Shabbat College in Hayward, California. Kurt, welcome to the seminar and we're gonna be hearing more from Kurt in following series along with Scott Brown. Thanks, Take Ken. it away, Kurt. Thanks, Ken. Thanks everybody for uh, giving me a chance to share today and, and we'll go ahead and we'll, let's go ahead and address Nelson's question real quick here. So what are the OEMs doing with their dealership training programs, including the ones at the community colleges to make sure their cars are perform properly repaired? And like Scott had mentioned, the manufacturers for many, many years because they carry the liability aspect of things, they tend to put quite a bit of focus on um, ensuring that the technicians that have gone through there have obtained a practical skill set. So almost always there is a practical side to that certification when they do that class. They might start out with an online prerequisite and then they'll go to a face-to-face -face hands on. And that has carried over into the community college programs as well. What many of the manufacturer programs are doing is actually more of the foundation and fundamental courses in the college levels. Um, many of them have kind of stayed away from the new technology stuff, the 
the hybrid, the EV, the ADAS and things like that as a formal certified training at those levels, we, we would provide an awareness and exposure to, but the manufacturer wanted to maintain that, that control over the um, full certification level through their dealer training network. So there's a lot with that. And one of the things that I've been using a lot lately is when I was in industry, I saw airbags come in, I saw anti-lock brakes come in, and later we saw hybrids and EVs come in. And initially, everything is maintained at the manufacturer level. They, they don't want that information to get out there because ultimately, you know, Billy Bob's bait and tackle and automotive repair, they might do work, but if something bad happens, they're going to try to sue that shop, but that shop doesn't have money. They're going back to the manufacturer because there's a deeper pocket there. So they've held information very close to the vest. As we've seen that transition with hybrid and now EV and especially with ADAS, we're seeing those same kind of things. So where a lot of the information is actually becoming available is from the tier one providers. It's, you know, companies like a Bosch or a Mobius or a Delphi or a Nip and Denso who are creating the parts that are being sold. They're actually providing a fair amount of information on operations and capabilities and then you have to refer back. Um, ICAR has been great of, find, of providing information because the collision industry has been very challenged with this uh, in many aspects more than automotive. Um, so my focus today is really going to be trying to make some connections with uh, the education side, you know, being able to build on where Scott was. And from, you know, touch a lot of different databases. So be able to touch from the automotive technician side, the heavy duty side, the collision side, and for those upper level people, for the management side that are dealing with fleets and stuff and the experience they've had. So for about the last four or five years, they've heard, get ready for EVs, get ready for EVs, get ready for EVs. You got to get your stuff. You got to get your technicians caught up. And they said, okay, what do I need to have and what do I need to do? And then there was a giant abyss. There just hasn't been the detail and, and it's been very repetitive. Do you need, do you need, do you need? Okay, what do I need? And that was a big part of the purpose behind this uh, series that we're doing is really to, to start talking about those two questions. What do my technicians need to know and what do they need to be able to do? Hopefully that's what we can accomplish over this series is starting to give those foundation pieces to where as you look into different training opportunities, and there are some out there and they're growing, to be able to then say, okay, I'm looking for one that can do these things. But more importantly, being able to start with, what do I have? So let's go ahead and change the slide. So let's think of this as a general thing. What do my technicians need to know? And, and this is very cross-platform. This is for that collision guy who's not necessarily doing the paint in the body, but he's doing the mechanical prepare. This is for that automotive technician. And even for that heavy duty fleet guy, because guess what, trucks, you already have some of these things and what you don't have, you're gonna have. So there's a lot of crossover on that basic fundamental level. And in the big picture, we need to look at new basics for all of our technicians. It's an evolution. So what is kind of cross-platform across all these areas? Workplace safety and pollution prevention practices. All of our technicians need to have solid foundations in those. Having the solid fundamentals in the ASE area. So for your automotive side, the A1 through A8s and bringing in the L1s. From the truck side, I believe their numbers are pretty similar, the T1s through the T8s and et cetera. All those foundation skill sets that your existing journeyman technicians should have. They should be up to speed with modern vehicle controls. So this is that drive-by wire stuff. It's the electronic throttle control, electronic transmission controls, electric steering. And the reason I bring those into play because those are those foundation pieces that allow us to have the ADAS operations that are the foundation then of the semi-autonomous and autonomous vehicles. So these are part of those new basics. Bus systems. 
Vehicles are a series of networked computers with different types of buses speaking different languages at different speeds with different protocols. And as these systems have aged, we're seeing some degradation. We're seeing new systems come in with the uh, um, addition of ethernet into many vehicles now to increase programming speeds and communications. And this is how all these modules are talking. So if we're applying this to an ADAS vehicle, that's how my cameras are talking, how my radar is talking, how my LIDAR is talking. If something's, one thing's bad on that bus, nobody gets to talk in some cases. So they need to have a good solid foundation. That would be another one of those new basics that they need to have. Obviously, fundamental hand tool, common shop equipment, DVOMs and oscilloscopes, because when it comes to oscilloscopes, that's how you're testing that bus. A voltage and a frequency is not going to give you enough information. I've got to see, is there capable and potential communication across that bus? And I can only do that with an oscilloscope. A good foundation, a working environment with scan tools. And this gets a little interesting because the scan tools, a lot of the time we check a fault code and maybe we get a little bit of the freeze frame data and we move on. From the manufacturer scan tools, they uh, built in a lot of those trouble trees, those fault testing programs or processes that you would follow. And it would really take you through that logistical or systematic diagnostic process. But that's OBD too. As we evolved with more electrification, remember OBD2 was based around vehicles for emissions related. Well, if we're talking an EV, we don't have emissions. So I don't have to have OBD2. And you're already seeing many of the EV manufacturers that are gonna come down the road is that I don't need to spend all that extra time, money and engineering to create a OBD2 based environment. I can have a PC diagnostic based environment to where I'm accessing it with a laptop, I'm connected, I'm pulling raw data it might be formatted into a spreadsheet, but I'm literally looking at PID cells or something very similar to like mode six type data and making some interpretations using some other tools to not just obtain the information, but to comprehend it and steer where I'm going based on it. Like Scott mentioned, information systems, I've got to be able to find information. And, and from the aftermarket side, it's extremely important. We all know that no one system, whether it's all data or shop key or, or anything else, no one has everything. And sometimes it takes multiples. And sometimes it takes going into things like ICAR or finding an OEM that has posted information or utilizing tools like an IATN and chats and, and industry groups. Industry is not gonna have information probably in one nice neat place for us. We're gonna have to be able to research. We've got to be able to vehicle program because nowadays 70% or more of the repair is going to involve programming. If you replaced a hardware component, it's probably going to need software installed in it for it to work. Or even if you've just done an upgrade to something, you've got to tell the rest of the car that, Hey, I've now changed this. So programming takes on a greater aspect, service maintenance, basic repairs, all of those kind of things. Documentation is huge. And like Scott mentioned, documentation, you might as well title in liability right with it. So you've got all the state requirements and all those kinds of things, but liability is that next line. And if you're not documenting effectively what you've done and how you've done it, you now put yourself at risk. And most importantly, effective communications. In the workplace today, and it doesn't matter what the workplace is, you've got to be able to work with and through others. And because of the more and more complexity and it's just plain harder to keep up, you've got to be able to communicate with people from a lot of different areas, a lot of different uh, points of focus and be able to provide information, receive information and move forward with it. And one of the big things that I want people to think about is all of these fundamentals, they're consistent, whether it's an automotive technician, a technician working in collision, or that fleet person, those same things are applicable across all of them. And for a long time, we've had concerns, you know, I know on the fleet side, there's the training is much less available 
than it is in the automotive and the collision areas. Well, the fleet guys can utilize a lot of these core automotive courses to give that foundation learning, give that entry level or even intermediate level training, and then go off to Mack trucks or you know whatever bus company for that more advanced or more specific training. Next slide, please. So what do they need to know? And many of these things on the EV side really correspond with what you saw from Kin at the very beginning of what their findings were with their grants, just a little bit more watered down. So when it comes to doing EV work, and this is EV from a hybrid up to you know, a Tesla semi, safety and personal protection equipment, that is absolute number one. Even though these systems are inherently safe, and there is multiple layers of safeguards built into them, it's critical that the technicians don't get too comfortable and they're not too afraid. You know, that, that cautious safety within them. They need to know materials handling because as batteries do age and batteries are gonna be replaced, there's going to be a process. Almost every manufacturer out there has an 800 number that they have working with a third party that is handling that recycling of those batteries. Uh, many of the lithium ion based batteries are going into second life as standalone uh, uh, storage. Uh, they're going into facility storages. So they're gaining a second life, even though they may have lost some of their capacity for an automotive application, they still have application in other capacities. High voltage batteries. The nice thing here is, is it doesn't matter if it's a giant battery in a semi or a battery in a Tesla, those fundamentals of batteries stay and carry across the board. Yes, voltages will change. Yes, chemical makeups will change. But once you have that solid foundation in high voltage batteries and, and how they're made, you can apply that in different directions. The same thing with AC motors. Once you have that foundation understanding of synchronous and asynchronous motors for AC. And yes, EV powertrains are three-phase AC. They're not DC motors. So it's a little bit different there. But once they have that foundation, they can apply it in scale. Converters and inverters, because we have DC batteries and AC motors, we have high voltages, we have low voltages, we've got to have the way to change it from AC to DC, from DC to AC, and to be able to go from 200 plus volts to 13 volts to run the radio and the lights. So these kinds of things, again, cross-platform. If it's on a semi, it's going to be a lot bigger, but it's still going to have that same principle of functions. System operations, understanding what is happening. How does a hybrid work? How does an EV work? Who is doing what and when are they doing it? Controls, who's controlling it? You know, how do we make that electric motor go faster? How do we make it go slower? All comes into play with that. And then finally, charging methods. The technicians need to have a good foundation because one of the things that comes in as a common complaint is I try to charge my car at home, but it always breaks the, super, the circuit panel breaker. Well, you're in an older home, the wiring may not be able to handle the capacity at that charge rate. Maybe you need to lower your charge rate. Or what's the difference between plugging in at home and plugging in at the, the parking lot or plugging in at that great big noisy thing, the DC gen, uh, fast charge. And what's this regen stuff or one pedal driving? Again, cross platform, doesn't matter who makes it, we can have that application. ADAS is another layer of things. ADAS is really the absolute foundation as we go to autonomous uh, vehicles. So everything we learn with ADAS, think of that as how autonomous or semi-autonomous is going to work. We add a computer, we add some software, we've got the hardware already in place. And what people don't realize is ADAS is this bright new shiny acronym for the last say three to five years. We've had ADAS some systems on cars for nearly 20 years. Yeah, nearly 20 years we've had some ADAS systems. It's just now we've got a bright new shiny name and we see a lot more of it and we're going to continue to see more. If I'm a collision technician, I'm living this right now. I'm living 
I have to have that vehicle extremely square and straight. If I'm in the truck side, the heavy duty side, you already have some of these systems, you're going to have more. And it's a good chance that some of the overland trucks are probably gonna have a higher level of semi-autonomous and even autonomous than the automobiles might have. Uh, Off-road equipment, you know, there's a lot of discussion in companies of having you know, farm equipment that are fully autonomous that will go take care of everything for you. And I don't need a, a tractor driver at that point. So we need to have an understanding of the safety related to ADAS um, in working with the equipment and how just little corrections, if the camera's off a little bit, it may see something that it shouldn't be seeing, but missing something that it should. Having an awareness on the sensors, whether it's a radar or a LIDAR or an ultrasonic, which is actually an old technology for us. Cameras, understanding how cameras are working, as well as thermal imaging, because we're starting to see more and more vehicles with night visions. General system operation and obviously the controls. Many of these ADAS systems are on by default and can be turned off and we'll probably see that continue. Next slide, please. So what do they need to be able to do? So we've got an idea what they need to know based on what they already know, what additions there are. Now we need to be able to figure out what do they need to be able to do beyond what they already can. So with the EV side, hey, they've got to demonstrate those safety practices. We don't want them to become complacent. Complacency leads to bad things. So understanding how to test their personal protection equipment. Every time I put the gloves on, I've checked them first. When I take the gloves off, I've checked them last. Always making that habit. Having the ability to do the applicable testing. So basic electrical testing as well as bus testing. Being able to do the testing on the high voltage batteries, the AC motors, converter inverters, the various controls. So those point to point tests. Not new. We're utilizing same tools, utilizing similar skill sets. It's just a different application of many of those things we already know. Being able to do the service maintenance and repairs of applicable systems. There's little differences, you know, the magic hybrid uh, thing to be concerned with is, is it on ready or not? Because if it's on ready and I'm doing an oil change, you know that engine's going to start when the oil's draining out and the car's six feet in the air. Absolutely guaranteed. At that point, everything's going to go downhill because panic mode is going to set in. You're probably going to be replacing an engine and you're definitely going to be cleaning up a big puddle of dirty oil on the ground after you've crushed your drain. So that's just kind of a reality. Those things go hand in hand. Being able to program the vehicle and programming vehicles, that has nothing to do with an, a, an EV or an ADAS. That's everything. That's absolutely everything for us. So that's one of those new basics. Acquiring and applying proper procedures. It's very important that they follow the correct steps. We don't want to wing this stuff because that's when people can get hurt and things can be damaged. And then again, full documentation. Always being able to document exactly what was done and according to the manufacturer repair instructions whenever possible. With ADAS, a lot of the similar stuff. We're still doing basic electrical testing. We're doing bus testing. Calibration is gonna be the newest thing. And of everything we talk about, we talk a lot about systematic processes, systematic steps. Calibration is one of those things. You absolutely have to do step one, two, three, four. If you skip, something bad is going to happen. It's not gonna see what it's supposed to see. It's not gonna react the way it's supposed to react or it might not work at all. And the part that people forget the most with ADAS, it, it starts with a visual inspection because little things like too much paint on the bumper cover or the clear wrap or an old worn sandblasted windshield. Take the mindset from anything related to a camera. If you can't see, the car can't see. So pouring rain, the hail, the snow, you, those systems aren't going to work correctly because they can't see, you can't see either. That's not a fault, that's normal operation. So learning to identify collision damage, signs of repairs, things like that, because a technician could spend a large amount of time 
trying to diagnose something that they're never going to be able to fix because that car used to be two cars that got welded together. Not quite straight. Service and maintenance and repair of all the applicable systems. So we're using our existing ABS stability control brakes. We're using our existing electric steering. We're using existing systems. It's just that now we have another, a little bit of outside and external control versus a driver's direct input in some cases. So as long as they know how to work on brakes, the difference between that brake system on a non ADAS car and the brake system on an ADAS car is sometimes the customer doesn't have to push the pedal. That becomes the differences. Same thing with the steering wheel. Vehicle programming, again, new basics across the board. Acquiring and applying proper procedures, new basics across the board. Full documentation, new basics across the board. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things I've tried to convey is the commonalities. There's not huge differences on these fundamental systems and fundamental basics, whether it's electrical, hydraulic, or mechanical, whether it's a tractor trailer, a vehicle that's been in an accident, or a car that's in the automotive repair facility. Those commonalities provide us with a lot of opportunities because we have a lot of existing training in place in the automotive side. The heavy duty side might not have it, but they could have that heavy duty guy go take that class in an automotive class, learn that foundation fundamental, and they could probably apply it quite well against that heavy duty vehicle. Same thing with the technician that's doing collision, uh, the technical collision work, not the body side, can take that information and be able to apply it in their job. So utilizing other educational systems that we might not have thought of. I don't have to find that collision repair class. I don't have to find that heavy duty repair class. I can use an existing auto class that are readily available out there. So commonalities, those fundamental systems, very common across the boards. AC and DC electrical operation and testing, common across the boards. Tools, equipment, diagnostic tools, those foundation knowledges, common across the boards. Safety and pollution prevention practices, again, common across the boards. EV component and testing, ADAS component and testing, ADAS calibration. Yes, the ADAS calibration stuff on a tractor trailer is gonna be a lot bigger, but it's still gonna have those same fundamental principles of a certain distance, a certain slope, as certain steps. It's just gonna be a different scale. Knowing the operations, for a long time, a lot of us have gone through the mindset of, oh, uh, you know, if you can fix it, the theory is less important. With modern technologies, the theory is extremely important. If I understand how it works, I can figure out how to diagnose it because there may or may not be a diagnostic process available to me. But if I truly understand how it works and I can do my fundamental testing in a systematic process, I can probably figure it out or narrow it down greatly. And then finally, documentation processes. It doesn't matter what aspect of the industry you're in, that documentation process is, is pretty similar amongst all of them. So again, commonalities, it allows us to have uh, an introduction and an intermediate level of instruction to be unified. So if I'm a school and I'm providing hybrid and EV classes, I can go in there and use the existing materials I'm teaching or even modify them some and create some industry-based classes and promote that to the collision side, promote that to the heavy duty side. And now I've got a whole different group of people that can come in and benefit from what we're doing because it's applicable to them at those solid levels. So that's, uh, that's my big piece today. So Nicely done, we're... Kurt. Nicely done. Yeah. I want to I want to uh, get you to answer a question as I asked uh, Scott. Uh, you are involved in the industry and you're teaching classes in addition to what you your normal curriculum. Mm -hmm. So you're doing some online things, but tell tell the uh, audience uh, what you're currently doing to promote and where where did you get your training on ADOS or did you just develop it over time? Uh, a little bit all the above. I, you know, having taught with BMW for a little over 10 years, 
A lot of it was some of the early systems that we had with those uh, active cruise control in the early 2000s and such. And, and as those came in and, and a lot of outside research, a lot of reading, uh, trying to get in as many different things as I can see, uh, all of that, it just kind of builds up. But once you get to a certain point with it, you start realizing, okay, it's just a, a change to this or it's an evolution of that. Um, so that's where a lot of that has come into play is, is just, you know, grunt work. Uh, right now at Chabot, uh, we just started classes this week. We're, we're doing uh, hybrid delivery. So our students are doing online for their lectures and some of their labs are online, which are more of the research-based type materials. Uh, but we do have on-campus labs. So we've got the social distancing and the masks and the disinfecting and all that kind of stuff going on because they've got to touch cars. They absolutely have to touch yeah. cars. Um, about eight years ago, uh, we brought in a, a hybrid and EV program and worked with uh, some people from industry to develop that. And that foundation material went out through a lot of the colleges in the state. And a couple of years ago, uh, we took a look and reviewed kind of what's being done statewide with uh, hybrid and EV curriculum. And, and we see that it's still kind of along the same lines. And, and it's those foundation practices uh, right now, we're in the process of, of getting all the approvals to offer um, new technology classes, which is really going to be focused around ADAS, uh, as well as going into some basic introduction programming and such, and, and, and creating an awareness, because the technology is the exciting part of our industry. That's what people are going to gravitate towards, and you know, having that aspect there, but taking on the mindset uh, a lube technician today is not the lube technician from 20 years ago. They need to have that hybrid and EV safety awareness because if they leave it in ready mode, something bad's going to happen. Um, so they need to have an awareness because they are around these systems. They're working with these systems. So we've got to address that in an introduction class, at least at an awareness level, and then build from there. Thank you. Um, Kurt, what I'm going to do is turn the questions over to you, but I okay. think that Scott should be answering these as well. So you start off and then Scott do the follow. Yeah, perfect. So Rick had fly, put one in there right at the beginning uh, with ADAS and other safety systems becoming more prevalent in combination with the lack of information to the consumer regarding these systems. Do you foresee changes in regulations regarding technicians working on newer vehicles, i.e. mandatory licensing of technicians, such as the California Smog Program? ASE is currently working on, ADA, on an ADAS test, as I'm sure you know. That, along with electrical engine performance at L1, could be combined to create a license structure. Now, I'll tell you from my standpoint, I've said for many, many years, we should license technicians. And there's people that are going to be on both sides of the fence with that. Uh, a lot of other countries, well, I'll use Europe, for example, in a lot of European countries, technicians are licensed. Uh, here, you can buy a set of tools, open up a door, and call yourself a shop and have whatever level of success or failure you may have. I think also licensing technicians also supports what Scott was mentioning earlier with improving wages. Because when we make it a profession, not a career in the broader eyes, that will change that. And let's look at what our industry is going through. For about the last year and a half, two years, car sales have been going down. Now we have COVID, car sales went down dramatically. We've seen shops close, shops reduce, shops lay off. And as we see a greater level of EVs come into place, um, that's going to impact maintenance. It's also going to impact what kind of a technician I need. I'm going to need that higher level of technician going forward. And that higher level of technician could get a lot of other jobs in a lot of other industries. So to be cost competitive, they're going to have to do it. And I was talking with a, a, a multi-dealer manager and he was saying, if I can find a Ford Power Stroke certified technician, I'll pay him $50 an hour to walk in the door because he couldn't find him. He was losing them to fleets all the time. So rarity is going to be a benefit to us in the big picture. And Scott, I'll let you add. Yeah. So uh, to answer your question about the licensing part, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at the aviation industry, even on private aviation, you, you've got a, a technician or a mechanic has to go through, you know, a certain amount of schooling, 
uh, then they qualify to take a class, uh, take a test, and then then they build a certain amount of hours, and then they take a proficiency exam. Heck, my daughter, who's a professional hairstylist, she had to take a test and do a proficiency test to prove that she knew what she was doing. Me, I don't have to do anything. I mean, if, if you know, to do my smog license, yeah, but you're not still you're not doing a, a proficiency test. Um, I think that in California, I think that we've got, there's a vehicle in place. Uh, if you look at the brake and light inspection, um, that really is kind of an old legacy thing. It's only being used, you know, when a car goes through, a, a, you know, it's, it's salvage title or whatever. And it's, you know, we have a brake and light inspection here and we hardly ever do those. But I see the ADAS could probably be folded right into that program and uh, so that there's some level of competency or, or, or liability, uh, so to speak, um, to, to be applied to that. So, and, and yes, ASE is currently working on an ADAS test. And I fortunately was uh, invited to the first session. Uh, we were going to have four, and I think they've had some virtual ones since then. But the first one was, was in, uh, in January. And it was first time that they combined the OEMs uh, from both the mechanical and the collision side all into one, one group. And uh, it definitely made for an interesting mix. Uh, the collision guys didn't want anything to do with the diagnostic side, um, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting. But, uh, but yeah, I, I see that there's definitely going to be some changes. And, and yeah, I, I, if you ask a consumer out there today, I'll bet you that most of them will just assume that a mechanic has to be certified to work on a car. And uh, that is not the truth. So, yeah. Hey, Kurt, on uh, the next question is from my friend Gordon Scott. Mm -hmm. So, agricultural equipment usually trails a few years behind the new vehicle market and in some cases have third party retrofitting with technology similar to ADAS. Are current options for owners and techs to gaining knowledge to service these vehicles, uh, vehicles able to offer relevant information? If not, are they even similar? I don't know a lot of depth on what's being retrofitted onto the equipment, but I'll take it from this standpoint. If for, let's say, a tractor to have levels of autonomy, it's going to have to have electric steering. It's going to have to have some sort of an electronic pump controlled braking system. It's going to have to have some sort of an electronically controlled throttling system. Those would be the absolute minimum things it would need. And really, those same things are what an ADAS system is using. So that ADAS system is available, is able to recognize something at a distance and then let off the throttle or apply the brakes or possibly even make some steering corrections depending on what it is. So I would, in my opinion, yes, if someone that was working on that kind of stuff went through even an automotive based program for ADAS, it would give them an understanding of what that relationship is. How does that camera work? How does that radar sensor work? What is it, what is it transmitting? How is it being comprehended, thought about, and what kind of corrections are being made based on it? And with the third party stuff, you know, it, it would be really hard to say, well, this brand is doing this, so it's gonna be very generalized. Uh, but I've, I've watched a few things and read a little bit that there's some of the, the uh, agricultural equipment companies, they're, they're already planning to build these things, you know, instead of having the, the big commercial farms where the company comes in and has six drivers and they work for three or four days and do all the fields, they're just going to send six robots basically out there and, and do it. Um, we've seen it on land grading equipment for a long time, the big uh, graded uh, blades. You'd see that big football looking egg on the end of the blade. Well, it was a satellite attachment and it would control the height of the blade so that they could level the, the area as best as possible. Scott, you got anything? To yeah. That? Yeah. So I, I would say, you know, let's not be afraid of any of this stuff because uh, these are just, they're percept, they're part of the perception system that's as applied to a vehicle, whether it's an, uh, you know, a, an agricultural vehicle or a truck or a big, big shipping truck. Um, if you learn how the, the basic sensors work, how a radar works, uh, and how it relates to the vehicle it's mounted on, right? It's, it's usually tied into the, to the center line of the vehicle somewhere. So some basic geometry, um, understanding how these sensors work, whether it's ultrasonic, radar, cameras, uh, having an understanding of how the cameras are actually using uh, 
uh, some of their filtering techniques to, to find edges. Uh, some of them have multiple cameras to help them with stereo vision that gives them the depth um, parallels and, and, and all that. So I think if you, you learn the fundamentals, then when it comes to addressing that on whatever vehicle it's on, it's going to become more elementary. Um, and, uh, and there you go. So definitely very, very good. Um, I think uh, the next one is just a request. And then John is talking to you, Scott. All right, so John, is NASDAQ currently in this loop? They operate on an education committee uh, that would benefit from this presentation. Yeah, certainly um, I, I am on the board uh, with NASDAQ. Uh, there's, there's a lot of education. We're actually uh, on a mission to, to really do some big um, communication efforts with NASDAQ through my uh, diagnostic network company. Um, and this is also, we're gonna get into security functions. Um, that's something that Kurt and I, we, we really didn't talk about, but perhaps we can talk about down the road because um, you, you all probably are familiar with the, uh, the, the two white hat hackers that, uh, that, you know, hacked into that Jeep. And uh, then the feds had to step in and had to tell everybody what to do, right? Um, a lot of these buses now are becoming private, right? So you got to have private CAN networks. Um, you're now having to have licensing or credentials to get in to do a uh, camera or I'm sorry, radar calibration on Ford vehicles. Um, I had one in the, in the shop here that we were doing some R and D on and um, yeah, you had to have your, your credentials, your NASDAQ uh, uh, vehicle security professional uh, credential to get in there. So um, yes, NASDAQ is, is fully aware. Uh, I would love to get more of the OEMs um, in tune with really what uh, the, the wants and needs are of the of the aftermarket, uh, because face it, we're 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 fixing seventy percent of that fleet uh, anyway, and uh, these vehicles are lasting a heck of a lot longer than than the the, the three to six year cycle that the OEMs would hope for. Um, <laughs> so they they're not selling new cars uh, like Kurt said. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm doing everything I can to, to push that. And I, I see that uh, there's gonna be no choice that these OEMs are gonna have to really start embracing. And I think the, the aftermarket, we need to step up and, and raise the bar as well. And uh, cause this is, uh, this is gonna be some interesting uh, times ahead. And there's a big piece to what Scott was saying there with the OEMs taking a greater uh, participation level in you know, for many, many years, they, they want to keep it in-house and, and it's fully understandable. They've, they've got the big pocket, so they've got the greatest liability. But at the same token, sales sell the car one time. And I say the car, I'll say the brand. Sales sell the brand one time. What sells the brand the second time is service. So if I take my car into shop X or dealership X and, and they can't seem to fix it, I don't necessarily blame the dealership. I blame the car usually. And I might take it to another dealership and hope and pray. And if two dealerships can't fix it, it's a brand issue. It's not those shops. And so now that second car sale, you're not going to make that. So it's, you would think that the OEMs would start to realize that, okay, yes, I need to have a better partnership with the aftermarket sector because the customer is leaving after warranty. They may or may not come back. Um, I think some of the dealer mindset is, is, well, if I never give them information, they won't do it and they'll send it back to me anyways. Well, what we have found from hybrid more than anything else is this information does get out there. The trainings do happen and those cars don't go back to the dealer and the aftermarket makes its own uh, system and entity and continues moving forward. So that, that's gonna be a big challenge for, for the dealers. They're gonna to have to find a way to have a, a greater participation. Kurt, the next question is for you, is from Michael. Yeah, so Kurt, do you think that AG equipment operators may be better prepared for autonomous electric technology transition than most folks think, seeing as users, owners, and operators have been integrating for some time new ag technologies such as GPS guided technology, semi-autonomous semi driving, et cetera. Most definitely. I think any group that's already got it a little bit, they're, they're by, their nature is to be more accepting of it. Uh, the group that scares me are the ones that are 
anti everything you know they're they're it's old school diesel mechanical pumps and all that kind of stuff and and because they're in their comfort zone there they're intimidated by change not understanding that that change may have some complexity but it also has huge improvements and huge enhancements to it so yeah i, I think the ag stuff I, I was reading an article not long ago i guess there's a, a huge battle uh, within the ag uh, service side to where, you know, farm owners want to be able to service their own equipment that the, the manufacturers are saying, Oh no, no, your warranty is going to be void if you service your own stuff. And, and we see that in the automotive side, but there are some laws out there. And I don't know if it's just a California law or a federal law that kind of maintains some, some standards in that you have the right to service your stuff. Um, but I don't know how universal that is, but I, I think definitely ag, uh, anybody that's using it, they're already a step ahead and, and they're not probably going to go backwards. They're going to continue to go forwards. Um, and Michael had another one right behind it. Question for all. Uh, what are some thoughts on developing new alternative fuel and advanced technology programs at community colleges and rural communities? I think, you know, here in California, it's, it's a little bit all over the place. Um, a lot of our programs, when we instituted uh, hybrid and EV, we dropped um, alternative fuels into it. The, the challenge that we've seen, at least I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, we don't, the alternative fuels have kind of gone away from the automotive application you know, with the Volkswagen diesel stuff. Um, Honda CNG's kind of really gone away from no longer being offered. Uh, E85's never been a big thing here in California. So for us, the alternative fuels on the car side's really gotten eaten up by uh, hybrid and now EVs. Um, in talking with some fleet side people, yeah, there's still a big, big push on, you know, alternative uh, fuels, the, the uh, I don't know all the proper terminology, you know, I want to say uh, recycled or recovered CNGs and things like that. Um, so I think then the more rural areas, those are schools that need to really invest in that because that supports their community at large. Kurt, I'm going to uh, tag on to that here. Um, this is Ken, and I am at a rural community college in Central Oregon. Uh, seven years ago, we had the vision of recreating and planning for the future, and not easy stuff to do. We uh, created a new degree, Automotive Technology and Electronics and Diagnostics, got that approved through the state, and we tagged in things like reprogramming vehicles, hybrid electric vehicles, and much more. Where we went for that source of income was the program through the National Science Foundation called Mentor Connect. And you can look that up, mentor-connect, and you will find that you can apply, any community college can apply for this $300,000 program to get started with buying equipment, redesigning your program, and there's much more. You can do something like a, uh, I call it the copycat program. If you said, I like what they're doing at COCC here in Bend, Oregon, I want to do what they're doing. And we want them to partner with us to develop our program at our community college. But it does take industry to join in. Industry is not left out of community college. We are all working at this together. So if you want more, you can always contact me at any time and we can go through some of the process of applying for those National Science Foundation grants. And a lot of that information in, in many of the colleges, their course outlines are fairly available. I mean, here in California, the statewide is what's called Curricunet. And you can almost search any other college's curriculum, their course outlines that are up there. Yeah, you're not going to have that daily lesson plan level, but you'd have the general overview of what that is. And and I know most of the instructors I've dealt with, they're very open. If somebody sends me a thing, hey, Kurt, you got something on this, I sent them stuff. Uh, I just finished a webinar series over the summer with a lot of the automotive faculty in Northern California for ADAS. And all the PowerPoints, uh, the recorded videos, I even sent my course outlines and, and what have you. Um, my mindset is, is the more of us that are doing it, the better it is gonna be for our students in our industry. Um, it, it's not an ego thing for me in my case. Um, I think we, 
you ask, you'd be surprised how much you can find. Um, and that information is all up on the, uh, the, the state's ATL site, the uh, Advanced Transportation and Logistics site. And that's available to view where there's quite a bit of ADAS uh, videos that we had done up there. Very good. Scott, last words. Uh, last words. Hey, this is great. I, uh, I really enjoyed uh, participating in this uh, panel. And again, I'm quite honored. I'm, I'm just a technician uh, working in the field. And uh, it's quite an honor to be here among uh, these, uh, these highly qualified individuals. So thank you for including me. I want to thank Kirk Shadbolt, Scott Brown. Uh, in the background, we have Brian Trice, Janet Menig, and especially Maddie, who's been with us and developing this uh, training for us. I want to thank all the attendees, and I'd like to just reinforce that we're going to be here on August the 27th, next Thursday. Register for that now. You won't regret this. None of these will you regret. This is a five-part series, and we're going to be talking about foundational training for electric vehicle technicians. Thank you, everyone. Hey, Ken, we had yeah. one guy squirt in right oh. at the end. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So what do we got? I got him. Uh, Marvin oh, okay. Campbell threw one in right at the last minute. Uh, EV inverter and motors do not break often. True. Is a recycle reuse training necessary to use uh, these parts that do not break? Yes, because things do break eventually or they may get replaced for other reasons. Um, I know taxi cabs oftentimes would replace the high voltage batteries in the Priuses because they had lost a few miles to the gallon and the cost effectiveness of putting a new battery in versus staying with the old. So there's always a recycling uh, tie in with it, especially here in California. We, we've, we have no choice with that. Um, yes, you can rebuild an engine from a junkyard and reuse it. Any thoughts for EVs? Uh, there are some companies that do motor rewinds. And, and I, I heard a story from one gentleman who took a Prius motor to a, a motor rewind or a uh, rewinder and they looked at it and they went, what in the world is this? They had never seen such a thing in their life. And they said, no, we can't do anything with that. But, uh, you know, well, recently Tesla came out and did some uh, million mile testing on a motor to the, you know, microscopic level and had no appreciable wear. They're doing testing right now and they're saying million mile batteries. The EV powertrain is probably not going to be what technicians are going to be doing a lot of work on in the future. It's going to be the body electronics and things like that. Marvin, uh, when you're here next week, ask that question to Dr. <laughs> Puerto. He will have uh, an earful for you. Uh, in our program, we are doing those repairs and uh, you contact the uh, uh, luscious garage and you'll find some great things happening there too. So yeah. there's good business to be had for all. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Great, thanks. Thank you.